Hi there and welcome to lecture 3 for Biostats. So today we're going to quickly review uh, confidence intervals and then we're going to go on to hypothesis tests and then uh, at the end we'll have a wee rant about p-values. So you remember that um, for a given population um, with a certain mean then we know that when we repeatedly sample from that population uh, that the uh, samples will end up looking something like the population so that the sample means compute so the mean sample mean computed from each sample um, ends up following a normal distribution under repeated sampling. So we can use the properties of the normal distribution to describe um, how the sample means are going to vary from sample to sample. So for example, we know that 95% of the samples that we take will have sample means within two standard deviations of the population mean, because we know for a normal distribution, 95% of um, samples are within uh, two standard deviations of the mean. So we can use this in two ways. Um, the first way we can use it is if we have a claim about a population mean, such that the population mean is some fixed value, then we can tell if our sample is extreme by just seeing how many standard deviations our sample mean is away from the claim. Okay, If it's far away from the claimed population mean, then our sample was very extreme compared to what the um, pop, what we'd expect if the, if the claim about the population mean was true. So our sample would be providing evidence against that claim, right, because it's extreme. Uh, the other way we can use it is that um, if we don't know what the population mean is, then we can, then um, given a sample, we can just add just enough uncertainty so that we capture the truth most of the time. So for example, if we add plus or minus two standard deviations, then we know that 95% of the time we will capture the truth. So this is the idea here, right? We've got our population, which we're going to pretend we don't know about, okay? Which is the situation we find ourselves in most of the time. And it will have some population mean, which again, we don't know. Then under repeated sampling, we know that if our sample means are going to jump around that unknown population mean, they're not all going to be equal to it. Sometimes we'll get really close and sometimes we'll get far away. But when we add a confidence interval for, for that, so if we make a range around each of those sample means um, using plus or minus, say, twice the standard deviation of the sample mean, uh, then that confidence interval is going to capture the truth, i.e. the truth will lie inside that confidence interval um, most of the time, right? So like all of these red confidence intervals here, but not all the time. Sometimes we'll have a black one that, that does not, uh, such that the confidence interval does not contain the, the population mean. So we know that 95% of the confidence intervals that we generate will contain the, the population mean if we're using um, you know, plus or minus two standard deviations. Now that 95% is a property of the algorithm, not a particular interval, right? So for one particular interval, either it does or it doesn't contain the population mean. It, it doesn't contain the population mean with probability 95% or anything like that. Okay, so for example, um, when we have just one sample, we don't know whether we're the black one or one of the red ones. Okay, so for a given one, we don't know if it contains the population mean. But we know that there's more red ones than black ones, right? So we know that over time, as we do lots and lots of confidence intervals, we're more likely to be right than wrong. Okay, so the interpretation really should be something like this. A 95% confidence interval for the population mean, whatever it is, is from A to B, some interval. This is the range of population means that are consistent with the particular sample data that I have. Okay, so we're not saying that the population mean definitely lies in this range. All we're saying is that this is the range of population means that are consistent with our data, or that our data are consistent with. Okay, so let's look at an example with the petrels um, from lab three. So you remember we looked at the right wing length and we saw that um, perhaps there was some small difference between males and females and that the um, distributions here look really similar. They have about the same range, about, um, about the same shape, but that the male distribution here, the whole thing has been shifted up a little, a little bit, right? Um, but there's a lot of overlap. And so this is what we see in our sample. What we want to know is whether that, um, that difference that we see is also present in the population. So one way we could do this is to find a confidence interval for the males and a confidence interval for the average right wing length of the females and see if those confidence intervals overlap. Okay, so that's what we have here. So here's our confidence interval for the female, here's the confidence interval for the male, this is just the code straight out of um, the 
the lab and you can see that there's no value for the mean right wing length that is consistent for both of them that is inside the intervals for both of them so we have some evidence here that males are bigger than females the other way we could have done this is instead of doing a confidence interval for the males and the females separately and then see if they overlap um, what we could do instead is to uh, compute the difference between the mean in the mean right wing length between the males and the females in our sample and use that as our measure and see whether the confidence interval for that measure contains zero or not. The idea being that if there was no difference in the population between male and female birds, then the means would be the same in the population, so the difference between the means would be zero. Okay, so if we work out what the difference is in our sample, which clearly isn't zero, it's something like about three units, then what we can say is how often would we expect to get three units by chance, or we could uh, say um, our best guess from our sample is three units, but we're going to have some confidence interval around that, and does that confidence interval around those three units contain zero? Right? If it doesn't contain zero, then it's not consistent with the population mean, uh, population difference being zero. And so that's what this uh, setup here does. So um, this is a what's called a two sample t-test, and so you're you're testing whether the the, the difference. Uh, so you're testing for the difference between uh, in the right length wing length between the sexes. So you can see it works out the average for the females, and it works out for the average for the males. And we can see that in this in our sample, the males are bigger than the females by about three units. And it's given us a confidence interval around that. Okay, so the difference is three units, but it could vary from 1.2 units up to 5.1 units. Now notice the sign on these are, is both negative. That's because we're doing the, um, the female group minus the male group, and the female group, of course, is smaller than the male group. So we're going to get our, um, the, our difference is actually minus 3.1 or something like that. Okay, so our confidence interval around that is saying, okay, we get minus 3.1 from our sample, but it could be as, as small as minus 5.1 or as big as minus 1.2, right? So our 95% confidence interval has females between 1.2 and 5.1 millimeters smaller than males on average. So in either case, it's saying females are smaller, right? Zero is not inside this interval. So we'd conclude that um, that our data set is inconsistent with the claim of a difference of zero in the population. So we'd conclude our data suggests that there is a difference between males and females, with females being smaller from somewhere between 1.2 and 5.1 millimetres. Now the other way we could go about this is with a hypothesis test, which is sort of the backwards method from this. So it works instead of it's we instead of starting with the sample, computing a confidence interval, and then seeing whether um, a claim is inside the confidence interval. Instead, we start with a claim about the population, and we then think uh, we then consider what sort of samples would we expect if the claim was true, and then we measure just how extreme is the sample that we have. And if our sample is extreme, then we'd conclude that it is inconsistent with the hypothesis because it's unlikely to have arisen just due to sample to sample variation. If our sample is typical with what we'd expect if the hypothesis was true, just due to sample to sample variation, then we'd say sure, our data probably is consistent with the uh, hypothesis, it probably any differences we saw probably just arose by chance. And it's the p-value from the hypothesis test that tells us this, so in this case it's this, this thing here. 0 0.0014 and the p-value gives us the probability that we would see a data set like this one with a per unit difference of about 3.1 just due to the sampling process if there was actually no difference in the population okay so we'll see how these are constructed so this is the basic idea right you uh, you make a claim about the population uh, which is that the population mean is equal to some mu some some number, right? And so for example, this might be for the difference between the sex, it'll be zero, okay? Then we know that 95% of the samples that we take are going, to be, uh, are going to have a difference between male and females in those samples, 
of around about zero. They're going to jump around a bit just due to sample to sample variation. Sometimes males will be bigger, sometimes females will be bigger. Um, the amount that they jump around is going to be dependent on the standard deviation of that of that difference, right? And that 95% of the time, the samples that we get are going to be within two standard deviations of the claim. Right, so here's a bunch of um, different samples being taken. This is the sample mean and the confidence interval that you, that you compute. And you can see the sample means are jumping around. And every now and then we get an extreme one just by chance. Okay, um, so this one here, um, we can we can tell it how extreme each of these are just by by working out how far in terms of standard deviations are we away from the claim. So this one here is three standard deviations away from the claim. You can see this is two standard deviations here. This one here is about one standard deviation away from the claim. These are the numbers here. Okay, so this one is three standard deviations below the claim. And, and we know that things being three standard deviations away from a mean and a normal distribution is pretty extreme. It's pretty rare. So if this was our sample, we would be concluding that um, there's potentially some evidence against the fact that the population mean is given by mu because we've got something that's very inconsistent with that claim. Okay, so uh, let's interpret the various outputs we get from the t-test here. We've already looked at the confidence interval and the means down here. What about this t thing? That's our test statistic. That's the number of, um, of standard deviations we are away from the hypothesis. Okay, so we're, we're minus 3.23 standard deviations away. Okay, and that's what's used to compute the p-value. So all we do is we plug minus, we just say, how often are you 3.23 standard deviations away um, in a normal distribution, essentially. Okay, and it, and it says uh, not very often. Okay, so the hypothesis test provides evidence as to whether a a specific hypothesis about the popul pop about a population parameter might hold. Okay, so your p-value then is the measure of how likely it would be to get a sample with a sample statistic, whatever that is, the sample mean, the difference in sample means or whatever, um, as large or larger than we observe in our sample due to sample to sample variation. Right, so we know we what we if the hypothesis is true, we know what we get through to sample to sample um, due to sample to sample variation. The p-value is just saying how likely is it to get this particular sample that we that showed up just due to that process. Okay, so the p-value is a probability; it's somewhere between zero and one. If it's really small, then it's saying uh, it's unlikely to for our uh, sample data to have arisen if that hypothesis was true. So therefore our data is quite inconsistent with the hypothesis. So we've got evidence against the hypothesis. If the p-value is large, then our sample statistic is typical of what we get um, from sample to sample variation. And so our data is going to be consistent with the hypothesis. So the process goes something like this. We start off with a hypothesis about a population. Uh, usually a population mean of some kind. It might be a difference between means or an effect size or all sorts of different things. They all follow the same um, basic idea. Once we've got a hypothesis, we then take a sample from that population and we work out the sample mean and the, samples and the standard deviation of the sample mean. Then what we do is we need a measure of how extreme the sample is. So we take the sample mean, we find how far it is away from the population mean in terms of the number of standard deviations. Okay, so we take the difference between the sample mean and the population mean, divide by the sample standard deviation, and that's the number of standard deviations we are away. All right, that's called the test statistic, and it just measures how extreme the population is, uh, the sample is compared to the population hypothesis. Right, and then um, we know how that test, test statistic um, it should be distributed under random sample to sample variation. Right, that's what the central limit theorem tells us. We, for example, for a population mean and a sample mean, we'd expect our um, our sample statistics to be normally distributed. So we can use that information to convert it to a probability of p-value. And we use the p-value then to make our conclusion. So, so the test statistic is only really used in the process of computing the p-value. Okay, so the test statistic usually, um, usually has some meaning, but it's only sort of a, um, 
a, a thing that we compute on the way to the thing that we're going to use for the conclusion, which is the p-value. Okay. Right, so let's look at an example and we'll work through it sort of pen and paper style. So we have our New Zealand beef and lamb interested in the average carcass weight of lamb exported to the UK. And then we have a claim by the UK authorities that the average carcass weight is 17.7 .7 kilograms. And so to check this, uh, we're perhaps a little bit sceptical of it. So to check it, we take a sample of 100 carcasses, weigh them and find a sample mean of 18.5 kilos and standard deviation of 5 kilograms. And so we want to know, is the UK claim reasonable? So we can see that we, we didn't get 17.7 .7 in our sample, we got something else, 18.5. But of course there was some variation from carcass to carcass. So what we want to know is really, is, um, is the difference here, 0.8 kilograms, is this actually uh, something that you'd expect, just due to sample to sample variation, or is this actually something that we wouldn't expect if this was the truth? And if it's something that we wouldn't expect if this is the truth, then we'd conclude that maybe this isn't the truth. Okay, so we state our hypothesis. Our hypothesis is going to be that the true population carcass weight is going to be 17.7 .7 kilograms. Now sometimes people call this a null hypothesis. I tend to just call it the hypothesis. Um, if you talk about a null hypothesis, then um, some, some people talk about an alternate, which would be um, the other option, right? So population mean not equal to 17.7 .7 kilos. Um, I tend to just call it the hypothesis that, you, that, that, that we're testing. Okay, so to check, step two, we take a sample. So we've gone and taken a sample, size 100, sample standard deviation 5, and uh, sample mean 18.5. So now we want to know how far is the sample away from what we'd expect under um, the hypothesis. So if the hypothesis was actually uh, true, so the population mean was 17.7 .7 kilos, then we'd expect our sample means to be somewhere around 17.7 .7 kilos, but vary maybe plus or minus twice the standard deviation of the sample mean. So we need the standard deviation of the sample mean, right, uh, which is this thing here. So remember the standard deviation of the sample mean is the sample standard deviation divided by the square root of the sample size. Right, so the increasing sample size decreases the standard deviation of the sample mean, thus making it more exact, more precise. So here we can do this easily, it's 5 divided by square root of 100, which is 0.5. All right. So how many standard deviations is our sample mean away from the claimed population mean? Well, we can take the difference between the sample mean and the claimed population, so 18.5 minus 17.7, .7, that's 0 0.8. And then we just want to know how much, how many standard deviations is 0.8, right? So 0.8 divided by 0.5, our sampling standard deviation says it's 1.6, right? So we're 1.6 standard deviations away from the claim. Now remember that 95% of the time you're within two standard deviations. So we're definitely within two because we're only 1.6 away. So this is something that we'd expect to happen fairly frequently. In fact, we'd expect it to happen um, about 88% of the time. Okay, now the p-value is the probability that um, we would get something as extreme as the sample that we have in front of us, or more extreme. Okay, so how often would we get something 1.6 standard deviations or more away? Okay, so this is the, um, the, the area in the tails, if you like, of the distribution. We'd know we'd have about 88% in the middle, so we'd have about 11.3% on the ends. Right, this is computed, um, the computer tells us this, right? Um, we know that it must be about right, right? Because um, if we, uh, we know that um, within plus or minus 2, which is further out here, so less tail area, um, we've got 95%, so, the, uh, um, so if the... If the um, if we were pl uh, two standard deviations away from the the um, the claim, our p-value would be 0 0.05, right? Um, because we've got 95 percent inside, 5 percent outside. Okay, so if the claim were true, we'd expect to see a sample like this uh, fairly regularly, um, about 11.3 percent of the time, just due to sample to sample variation. 
So this happens quite often, it's one in nine or something. So we don't really have much evidence um, with this particular sample to dispute the claim. Now, note that, I, that we don't say that we believe the claim to be true, right? Because, let's face it, the UK are probably lying to us, right? And we, the reason we don't do that is we can always collect more evidence, right? We can always go out and just increase our sample size. And if we increase our sample size, we increase n, then we increase the denominator of the standard deviation. So we um, decrease the standard deviation. So if the 0.5 maybe drops, so if we if we double double n, the 0.5 will drop to something like 0.3ish. Okay, and if this drops to 0.3ish, then this increases to maybe something like uh, 2.3. Okay, and if this increases to 2.3, then we, our sample is more extreme, and so our p-value gets smaller, and we have more evidence. Okay, so if it turns out that our p-value is large, we don't say the hypothesis is true. Instead, we just say, well, our data is consistent with it, so it could be true, right? We're not saying it is true, because it probably isn't. It's probably not exactly 17.7 kilos. It's probably something a bit different to that. Maybe it's close to 17.7, .7, right? But we don't know the exact number, so we're not going to say that that's definitely true. Instead, we just say, well, our data are consistent with that claim. So we don't do this in, with pen and paper, of course. Um, we use a computer to do that for us. So the t-test um, command, which we've already seen to do confidence intervals, also gives us that p-value if we specify the um, the claimed mean. Right. So here's our LAM data. We read it in, and we've used a claimed mean of 17.7 .7 kilos. And sure enough, it's worked out the mean 18.5 kilos. It's given us the confidence interval, and it's given us our p-value that we computed before. Okay, that's the 1.6 there that we computed by hand. Okay, so the general process is for hypothesis test is that you state the hypothesis, then you go out and collect your sample. Now the order of those is important. You don't look at your sample, you don't go and collect a sample, look at it, and then determine what your hypothesis is, because of course you've then generated your hypothesis conditional on the data, and sure enough, the data will show that your hypothesis is wrong, right? Because you've, you know, you've made up a hypothesis that clearly is, uh, you know, so say you look at the petrol's data, you see that there's a difference between male and females, and then you, you claim your hypothesis then is that there's no difference in the population, right? Well, you know that that's unlikely to be true because in your sample, you've already seen that there's a difference, right? So that's kind of bogus. So you should ideally have a hypothesis that you come up with first. Now that may be based on pilot data or something, right? You go and collect some data, you see what the effects might be, or you um, you have some ev other evidences as to what the, the effects might be. Then you state your hypothesis and go and collect new data to test it. So from your sample then, you compute your test statistic, which is just your measure of how extreme your sample is compared to the hypothesis. And sometimes it will have some meaning. So for example, for testing for a mean, it's the number of standard deviations of the sample mean you are away from the population mean. You then know how that test statistic is uh, distributed. So for example, in the, if you're testing for a mean, then it follows a normal distribution. So you can use that information to convert that test statistic to a p-value. Okay. So again, the test statistic is just to go from the, from the sample data summary statistics to the p-value. Okay. Then you use the p-value to come to your conclusion, right? So if your if your p-value is very small, then your p-value you remember is the probability of your data arising, given the hypothesis is true. So if the p-value is really small, then you're saying, well, this data is really extreme. I didn't expect to see this, right? So if your p-value is very small, then you don't expect to see this due to sample to sample variation. So there's some evidence against the hypothesis. If your p-value is large, then that's saying that, well, this is something that I did expect to see, therefore it's something that's consistent with the hypothesis. Okay. Now, of course, there's the question as to how small and how large it has to be before we make this decision. Okay, and we'll, we'll look into that in a moment. So let's look at two examples first.
Here we have some insect sprays uh, deployed onto some surfaces and um, then we uh, count the number of insects that died on the surface um, due to each of the sprays and we want to know are the sprays different. So we collect a sample um, from our two sprays A and B and just looking at the data it seems as though B is um, is better at killing bugs than A, right? It tends to kill more bugs than A. So we want to know, does this is this likely to happen generally, or did I just get lucky with my sample? So we throw it into t-test and we look for, is there a difference in the counts by the spray? So here's the mean in the, in the A group, 15.5, and here's the mean in the B group, 19.1. And so we're computing a confidence interval for the difference is minus 5.6 to minus 1.5. This is A minus B, of course, that's why they're both negative. We see that zero is in the interval. Zero would be no difference. So our conclusion from the confidence interval would be that uh, that zero does not seem to be a, a, a value that is uh, that, that our data are consistent with. Here's our p-value. It's very small. Okay, 0 0.00148, so it ha uh, we, we would expect to get a sample that looked a bit like this one about 0.15% of the time, which is not very likely. So our conclusion would be that our data are inconsistent with the sprays having the same performance. Thus, there's going to be ev the, there's evidence for a difference in efficacy between the two sprays. And in this case, spray B seems to do better then, then spray A uh, by between 1.5 and 5.6 insects on average. Right, so you'll notice here when I've summarized this, I've given the p-value and I've also given an effect size. So I've given the magnitude. I haven't just said there's a difference because that would leave the reader saying, okay, but which spray should I use, right? And so giving the magnitude, saying spray B seems to be better, and giving a magnitude of how much better, or a magnitude of how big B is compared to A, you could do a confidence interval B and a confidence interval for A if you wanted to. Um, nonetheless, we do give a, 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 um, a measure of magnitude. Right? The p-value by itself is not a useful measure for a reader because it just tells you, um, you know, sort of how much evidence you have for that difference. It doesn't tell you what the difference is which is far more important. Uh, what about this uh, one? So we've got another two sprays here, spray C and D, and again we see a difference in our, um, in, in our sample data, but perhaps it's not as clear. Um, this time we get a p-value of 0 0.09, so we'd expect um, data to, that's looking like this to arise, or more extreme than this, to arise about 9% of the time, which is pretty regular, pretty often. So um, our conclusion would be that um, our data is probably consistent with the sprays um, being quite similar. Okay, notice the confidence interval tells us this as well. Okay, so this is the confidence interval, the difference between group C and group D. Then you can see that uh, zero is a possibility, right? Because our confidence interval goes from minus 3.8 to plus 0.3. So this is saying C is either 3.8 units, um, uh, so spray C uh, ends up with 3.8 insects fewer than spray D, or at the other end, at the other sort of more extreme, um, spray C does 0.3 insects better than spray D. So spray C is either better or worse, therefore could be the same. Okay. Right, so there's the question of how big or how small the p-value should be, right? Um, now many of you, I suspect, and um, many people in general, use p equals 0 0.05 as a cutoff. And so you dichotomize your p-value and you say if it's less than p 0 0.05 then we've got evidence against the hypothesis. So our data is telling us our hypothesis is wrong and if p is bigger than 0 0.05 you just go, eh, maybe it's right, maybe we have to accept the hypothesis. Now this is a really bad thing to do, and the reason that it's a bad thing to do is you're taking a measure that's quite noisy, which is the p-value, right? The p-value depends on the sample mean and the sample standard deviation. If you take a different one, you're going to get a different answer, right? So the p-value itself is quite noisy, and then you're dichotomizing it, 
at a fixed cutoff, which makes it even noisier. Okay, uh, a simple way to, to, to think about this is what if you take a sample and your p-value turns out to be 0 0.049, right? It's below 0 0.05, so you'd say, woohoo, I've got evidence against the hypothesis. But what if instead of getting 0 0.049, you got 0 0.051? It's bigger than 0 0.05, and now suddenly you've got no evidence. Even though 0 0.049 and 0 0.051 are actually essentially the same number, right? So don't dichotomize your p-value because the magnitude of the p-value is important, right? There's a big difference between 0 0.00001 for your p-value and 0 0.1 for your p-value, right? It's the magnitude that matters, not whether it satisfies, whether it sort of gets over any particular um, arbitrary cutoff. The general rule is include the p-value itself when you report any of your findings. Okay, that way the reader can make up their mind. Now you can round the p-value if you wish because the p-value is noisy, right? Um, but you don't round it to the point of saying yes or no, right? So you can round it to, um, you know, 0 0.04, 0 0.06, fine. Um, because what you want to know is really the magnitude. So is it, you know, basically how many zeros are in front of the p-value? Um, the reason, there's several reasons why the 5% cutoff is, is bad, but one of them is if you give someone a target, they're going to hit it, right? So um, there's quite good evidence of bias in just about every area of um, published literature because of the p-value. So for example, if you just look at the number of effects that are claimed as being real across um, huge number of pu published studies, there's more real effects than you would expect um, given given that 5% threshold, right? So the, the uh, negative effects aren't being published. So ones where the p-value is bigger than 5% don't get published. And this is a diagram that sort of, sort of shows this. So this is looking at a bunch of studies um, in the social sciences, but you can replicate this in just about all sciences. And it's just looking at um, how strong the statistical results were and whether those studies ended up being published. And you can see that if the statistical results were null, that, that means essentially uh, the p-values were large, then you can see that the majority of the studies, 70% of them here, were not even written up. A few more were written up, about another 20% or so were written up, but weren't published. So 90% of those studies were not even published, and only a few of them made it into a top tier journal. Whereas if the statistical effect was strong, then it was almost certainly written up, only a few of them, about 10% uh, of them, 10 or 20% of them or so, um, were not written up. All the rest were written up. Um, over half of them were uh, published, and a big chunk, about 20%, were published in a top tier journal. Okay, so there's bias um, in that once you give someone a target, they'll go and look for it. The other problem with the 5% threshold is that 5% isn't that small, it's 1 in 20, right? And things, things that happen every 1 in 20 happen really regularly, right? There's, that's like one day in three weeks, right? So if you think about strange things that happen every one day in three weeks, that that's like happens all the time, right? So if you test lots of things, for example, then on average, so if you test 20 things, on average one of them will have... Um, a p-value less than 0 0.05, even though there's no effect at all going on, right? So if you just if you just sample from a population where you know the answer, then one in 20 of your samples will be extreme by definition, okay? So this leads to um, essentially searching for results or publishing um, results on small samples that um, aren't really that important. So you, you sort of get this, you know, you, you would have seen this, chocolate is good, chocolate is bad, right? Study this week showing that red wine is um, protective against heart disease. Check back in two weeks, there'll be another one saying the opposite, right? So here's an example here from XKCD. 
right? If you give someone a target and they don't hit it the first time, they're going to look further, right? So maybe you're looking for the difference between male and females responding to some advert or something, right? So there's some advert, you put a male and female, males and females in front of it, and you, you assess how they respond to an advert. And you don't see any effect, any difference. They respond the same way. So you then you look, oh, well, maybe it's actually males that are less than 20 compared to females that are bigger than 70 or something, right? And, and then you see an effect if you look at enough subgroups, right? Because essentially you end up testing more than 20 things, okay? The other problem with the p-value is that it's backwards to what you want, okay? So what you want when you have um, a hypothesis to test is you want what's the probability of it, that the hypothesis is true given my observed data. So I've gone and collected my data, this is what it looks like, now I want to know what this, what's the probability that that claim, claimed hypothesis is true. But that's not what the p-value is, the p-value is the other way around, the p-value is What's the probability of observing the data if the hypothesis is true? Right, so what we want is what's the probability of the hypothesis given my data. The p-value is this is the probability of the data given the hypothesis. So it's backwards to what you want, which is completely unintuitive. And many, many people mix the two things up. Okay, so the p-value is not the probability that your hypothesis is true. The p-value is the probability that you'd observe the data if the hypothesis was true. These are very, very different things and you cannot go from one to the other easily. Essentially it means that you should want a much smaller p-value if your sample data is the only evidence you have for whatever is going on. But really you shouldn't be relying on a p-value by itself anyway. You should have some external information that supports your hypothesis, right? You, you shouldn't sort of hang your hat on a bunch of st statistical analysis. You should have some other intuition as to why things are going on, some external evidence telling you that, that an effect is plausible. And if you do have external evidence telling you that your effect is plausible, then maybe having p equals 0 0.05 isn't too bad. Right? because your data is supplying some evidence, maybe it's not as much as you'd like, but it's adding to the other evidence that you have. Right? So your p-value by itself, the statistics bit of it, really is not super important. It's just helping you control for or quantify the evidence that your data has. Okay? There should really be evidence from outside of your data as well for whatever you're seeing. So the overall message really is to be skeptical of your data, um, particularly if it doesn't agree with other things that you know. And if you have doubt, then replicate, right? Or ideally publish everything anyway, right? So, so when, you, when, you, when you do report your findings, include the data so that other people can then use it later if they decide to replicate. Now, what we've discussed with the p-value and your statistical results uh, generally is only part of the story. We've been assuming all along that our sample is representative of the population and usually the biggest problem with your data is that it's not representative of the population and sometimes you can correct for that um, and sometimes you can't and if you can't correct for it then you've got to be very very cautious indeed so here's a very famous study from uh, Stanford in the 60s that put a marshmallow in front of preschool children and suggested that they could have another one if they can hold out for 15 minutes without eating the first one. They then looked at those same kids later in life uh, and looked at whether the delayed gratification as a child was associated with positive aspects of um, behaviour and so on. And what they found is that kids that didn't eat the marshmallow and waited for the second ended up scoring better on tests than on various behavioural outcomes. So the conclusion was that willpower in preschool correlates with success in life. And this was widely reported and um, was something that was acted upon. But the original study was done on just 90 children, so the sample size was relatively small, and it was done in a specific context. It was at Stanford University Preschool. And of course, preschoolers that, that are at Stanford University Preschool are probably not representative of preschoolers in general, because the uh, 
the preschoolers attending Stanford University are likely people that work at Stanford University. And people that work at Stanford U University are not a representative sample of people in general. Okay, you're going to have a range of people, obviously, but the range is going to be quite stark. So there was a, a the study has been replicated um, in, um, again and again, really, to, to assess this. And generally, um, they found that, um, that these findings do not replicate. So a bigger study in 2018 um, specifically focused on ensuring the sample was rep representative with respect to the demographics of the parents. So things like ethnicity, uh, the age of the mother, education and uh, income, employment, marital status, lots and lots of stuff. And the follow-up study showed limited support that delayed gratification actually led to better outcomes. And instead, um, they showed that the capacity to hold out for the second marshmallow of the kids is highly related to the child's social and economic background. Right? So if the kids came from a, um, an economic background where they were essentially uh, never wanting anything, um, then they could, hold, you know, they, 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 they could hold out because they knew that marshmallow wasn't going to disappear. Whereas perhaps if they came from an economic um, upbringing um, where this wasn't the case, where perhaps um, things were a bit more precarious financially, then they realised that actually, you know, it's much better to take the marshmallow that's in front of me than wait for some uh, mystery marshmallow that may not may never eventuate. So here's some reading if you want to have a look at it. It's quite a fun study. Um, feel free to follow those uh, links. The other thing about the p-value is it's not actually useful for um, for you to evaluate whether uh, the whether the treatment that you've found the effect that you found is actually of practical significance because the p-value conflates uh, the magnitude of the effect and the uncertainty of the effect together into one measure so here's an example we've got some doggy diets we've got two of them um, perhaps you have quite a an overweight dog, it's a big dog obviously, um, because uh, you, there's, uh, the oomph uh, doggy diet can uh, result in an average loss of 10 kilos with some standard error of 4 kilos. And then you've, there's some other um, doggy diet precision results in an average loss of 1.6 kilos, which isn't as much, but has a much smaller standard error of 0.4 kilos. Which one would you choose if you wanted your dog to lose weight? Well, if you, we look at the p-value for precision, then um, it's going to be very small, right? So it's going to be, um, if we look at the p-value for do these make a difference to weight loss, i.e. is the weight loss bigger than zero, so you do 1.6 minus zero divided by the standard error, so that's 1.6 over 0.4, which is 4, so your p-value is really tiny. Whereas the p-value for oomph is larger, so you do uh, uh, 10 minus zero is 10 divided by the standard error is 4, 2.5. So the p-value is something like 0 0.02. So based on the p-value, you've got much more evidence of precision resulting in weight loss than you have for oomph weighting, um, resulting in weight loss. So there'd be more evidence for an effect of precision than oomph. So should you, should you use precision? No, of course you shouldn't use precision. If you look at the confidence intervals for oomph and the confidence intervals for precision, um, Precision is 0.8 to 2.4 kilos, so you're 95% positive that you'll lose, that the, the dog's going to lose between 0.8 and 2.4 kilos, whereas for oomph, you're 95% confident that you're going to be losing between 2 and 18 kilos. So the range of possibilities for oomph is much larger than it is for precision. And we can compute the 95% confidence for the difference between the two. So if we look at the confidence interval for the average weight loss of oomph minus the average weight loss for precision, then it's 0.36 to 16.4 kilos. So we're 95% confident that if you if you used oomph rather than precision, that oomph would result in weight loss of 0.36 to 16.4 kilograms more than precision would. So the confidence interval gives us the magnitude of the effect as well as our uncertainty because we've got two numbers involved. Right? So looking at the p-value here, you'd prefer precision, but in fact the confidence interval tells us that, oomph, that we're 95% confident that, that, that the oomph one, the one with, that's less precise, is going to give us more weight loss 95% of the time. So that's the one we should be preferring. Okay? So the general 
idea is that confidence intervals tell you more information than the p-value does. So if you're reporting your results, go ahead and report the p-value. That's important because it enables us to gauge how much evidence we have. But on its own, it's not useful because it doesn't tell us the practical effect size. Right? So for example, we've got lots of evidence that precision is important, but it's going to result in hardly any weight loss. A couple of kilos, which might be all you're looking for. Fine, go with precision, right? because we've got lots of confidence about it. Whereas oomph isn't very precise, there's a big range of varying uh, amounts of uh, weight loss in the dog, but the weight loss is bigger in magnitude, right? So if you, if you require your dog to lose a lot of weight, you're going to be wanting oomph rather than precision. So even though you're, you're less confident about it, it's going to result in more weight loss. Okay. So hypothesis, the idea, remember, is to state our hypothesis before collecting our sample. We then collect the sample, compute the test statistic and p-value using a computer. We then look at the p-value and we say, is it small? If it is, you've got evidence against the hypothesis because your data are not consistent with the claim. If the p-value is large, your sample is not out of the ordinary. It's just something that happens all the time. Okay, so our data is consistent with the hypothesis. Don't threshold it. Instead, state your state the p-value. You're allowed to round it a bit. That's fine. It's the magnitude that matters. Okay, and then report a confidence interval. If you have an effect size, report the effect size as well with the uncertainty because that's almost always more useful. Okay, that's it.